All right, so today's date is going to be 4-11, and the title of the section is called Heat Transfer. Okay, so Heat Transfer. All right, so I'm going to draw up here on the board for you um, a couple different pictures. First one is a tea cup, and this one is going to be a tea pot. Okay, and I'm going to ask two questions. The first one is, which has a greater temperature and the second one is going to be which has more thermal energy okay so those are the two questions I'll let you copy that and then we'll start to talk about it. No, this is day two. Uh, well, we have day three, and then day four. Okay, so we got a teacup, and we got a teapot, and we're trying to figure out which one's gonna have a greater temperature, and which one's going to have more thermal energy. Now, Connor, looking at those two items that are up there, in your opinion, which one of them has a greater temperature? Okay, and why do you say that? Okay, so there's only a small opening on there. All right, Myla? So the heat's getting trapped inside because there's a small opening. All right. Hmm. Yeah, Jack. Um, because it's like a burner. Like a stove top or something like that. You're gonna say? Yeah, All right. All right. Okay. All right. Now, does anybody say that the tea cup is warmer? How about any? Think well, so? Because like the beaker heats up really fast and then you put it on the stove. Okay. So you think it could potentially be the teacup? Mm -hmm. Alright. Anybody say that they both are the same? Alright. Think they're the same? Yes. Megan, think they're the same? Alright. <coughs> the answer is right now we don't know. Oh. We don't know. It's because. Because some of you are saying, well, if it's on the stove, the teapot could be warmer, right? And that could be especially true if the teacup has been off for 20 minutes and it's just simply sitting on its side and or sitting over on a table, the teapot is continuing to sit on the stove. Of course, then this one would have a greater temperature. But it could be the same if the teapot just came off the stove and you pour it into the teacup. They'd have the same temperature, wouldn't they? And if you poured the last bit of tea into the teacup, and this wasn't on the stove, the teacup could have warmer temperature. So technically, it could be either or. And I did that question to kind of trick you to open up our discussion of how we can actually measure, bless you, bless you, measure the way in which we know which one has a higher temperature. Anybody think of a way to figure out which one has a greater temperature? Is there some way that we can measure this? Yep. We could use a thermometer. That'd be an excellent, excellent idea. So you could take a thermometer and put it into your teacup and you could take a thermometer and put it into your teapot. 
So we should probably take a minute to define a thermometer. And so a thermometer is a device used to measure temperature. It's a glass tube with a bulb on one end that contains liquid. And they now use kind of like an alcohol or mercury. Yep. And so that's what a thermometer is going to be uh, used for. And a thermometer can measure things in Celsius and Fahrenheit. Okay, so Celsius and Fahrenheit are going to be the ways that a thermometer is able to measure the temperature. Okay. So what's the difference between Fahrenheit and Celsius? What's the difference between Fahrenheit and Celsius? Think. Yeah. Okay, it's a different way of measuring it. So do they have the same temperature readings? Okay. Um, all right, so they don't have the same temperature readings. Is there another way of describing the difference between Celsius and Fahrenheit? Because they do have different readings, absolutely. Zero degrees uh, Celsius is totally different than um, than what it would be for you know Fahrenheit. What's the difference between an inch and a centimeter in terms of the way that we describe it? Yeah. Okay. But how are they different aside from just size, like yeah? Oh, yes, 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 yes. So what happens is one of them is metric, and they do have differences in terms of how long something is, like the inch is longer than the centimeter, and Fahrenheit is warmer than Celsius, even though they have the same temperature reading. So for example, zero degrees Celsius is what in Fahrenheit? Does anybody know? 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so when we're talking about outside, Freezing point, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, is zero degrees Celsius. What about if we have 100 degrees Celsius? Anybody know what the reading is? I don't want to take a shot. Okay. It's 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is boiling. All right. This one is the metric system, okay? And you are going to be using Celsius through high school and so on. So you're going to have to start to get used to at least being able to be familiar with the term Celsius and how uh, that works. All right, so we put it into our different uh, into our different cups and pots, and we get some readings. So now what we discover is the fact that this one is going to be 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and this one is 100 degrees Celsius and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Huh, interesting. Jack, what do you notice about the data that's up there now? Um, so that the teacup is 100 degrees Celsius, 212 Fahrenheit, teapot temperature is 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The it's the same, which means that they have the same temperature. But how did the thermometer work to measure the temperature? And in order to understand that, we have to give a definition for temperature. The temperature is 
the average motion of particles in an object. Okay? I am going to square in average because you're going to see another definition that's going to look very similar to temperature and it's only going to have one word that's different. Okay? So temperature is the average motion of the particles. And so what we said is that this teacup and this teapot have the same average motion of particles that are in there. The same average. Well, how the heck did the thermometer get a reading? How did it work? Okay, so if this is our let's back that up. If this is our thermometer. And inside here we have that liquid alcohol. How does that liquid go up or come back down? How does it go up or come back down? Oh. So what's inside the water? What's inside the water? What makes up the water? You know what makes up the water? You know the chemical formula for water? H2O, right? Which means that there are hydrogens and oxygens that are inside of here. And there's lots of them. And those hydrogens and those oxygens are made up out of particles, so photons, neutrons, and electrons. And so what's happening is that as we increase the temperature, so as we increase temperature, the particles move faster. Okay, so they're starting to move faster. So they're moving all around. And occasionally and frequently, they are going to collide with the thermometer. And we said that if the th temperature is increased, the particles are going to move faster. We can also say the opposite, that if you decrease the temperature, the particles move slower, which means there's not going to be as many collisions occurring inside of there. So what causes the liquid inside the thermometer to go up if we increase temperature? What's happening inside of it? What's happening inside of it? You guys ever taken your toothpaste and pushed on the bottom of the toothpaste? Yeah. What happens to the toothpaste? It moves forward. It moves forward. And if you keep pushing it, what's it going to do? It's going to come out the tip of the tip of the uh, toothpaste hole thing, right? So the same thing can be true about a thermometer. What are you applying to the toothpaste when you push it out of the hole? Yeah, force or pressure, right? So what's happening inside here is that there are all these particles that are making collisions that are occurring inside of the of the water. And by making more uh, particle collisions by increasing the temperature, it's going to put more and more pressure onto the outside of the thermometer. And as it does that, it kind of constricts this and causes the liquid to be forced upward. And last year, we had some really, really, really cheap thermometers. And so what do you think happened when the water got heated and the thermometers could only go to a maximum of 100 degrees Celsius. And the water was going all the way at the temperature because we had some impurities. It wasn't distilled water, it was, it was tap water. So there was, there were some minerals that were inside of there that was, it was going all the way up to 104 degrees Celsius. 
What do you think happened to the thermometer, Colton? It, it didn't explode, but it cracked, and then the liquid came out. Could that hurt your skin? Uh, it's just, no. I mean, the, the, the glass kind of, you get cut by it, but I mean, it's not like an explosion. Or anything. It just cracks, and then the, the solution leaks out. So what happened is a lot of times the thermometer would kind of crack and then the liquid would come out because of the fact that it could not hold any more pressure and the pressure was being created by the force of the particles. Does that make sense to everyone? So we ordered new glass thermometers which actually go all the way up considerably higher because um, here we have this going all the way up to 100 degrees Celsius. This one can actually go all the way up to 140 uh, degrees Celsius. So they can go much higher which means that you can put them in water and not have to worry about them cracking, okay? So this is how a thermometer works, and so what it's doing is it's reading that average motion of particles, because remember, it's not going to be able to record all of the particles that are inside of there. It's only gonna be able to take an average. Make sense? All right. Then, the second question, so we'd say that the two temperatures are equal to each other because they have the same average motion of particles. The second part says, which has more thermal energy? Okay, which has more thermal energy? Which one do you think? Lila, which one do you think has more thermal energy? It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, just pick one that you think and give me a reason why. Okay, teapot, how come? Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So, what's thermal energy? So, we should probably go in and define that. So, thermal energy is going to be thermal energy is the total. motion of particle movement in an object. Okay, so I'm going to box in the word total, and so this one should look very, very similar to temperature. And the only difference, really, between it, and you, there, in the book it gives a fancier definition. This is kind of a, a simpler version of it. But this one is total. Temperature was average. So now what we're doing is we're looking at all the particles that are in a solution. And we're trying to figure out which one has more energy. Which one has more energy. So looking at this, Lila said that she thinks that the teapot has more thermal energy than the teacup because she's saying that there's more total motion of particles. Matthew, do you agree or disagree with Lila? If we said that it, our definition is going to be the total amount of particles, okay, so it's the total motion of all the particles that are in there. And we're looking at it and saying the teapot has, she said that she thinks the teapot has more thermal energy. Do you agree or disagree? I agree. I agree? How come? Because it's like more enclosed. Okay, more enclosed. Does that change the amount of particles that are inside there? Okay. All right. Yeah. I think it would be the same because if they're the same temperature, they're the same Okay. So by saying that, what you're really saying is that they're the same amount of particles in the teacup compared to the teapot. That's, that's technically what you're saying, is that, that between the two of them, they have the equal and same amount of particles that exist in them. Is that true? Okay. Which one has more? So what we'd have to do is we'd have to figure out how much there is in these two objects. And if I tell you that this one has eight ounces of water and tea in there, and this one has... 100 ounces, does that change anything? Yeah. Okay. What do you think? Brooke, what do you think? Which one has more thermal energy now? They're at the same temperature. The teapot has 100 ounces. Teacup 
has eight ounces. Which one has more total movement of particles? The, the teacup, you said? Okay. Anybody disagree? All right. You should disagree, okay? Because let's go back and think about this for a second. That's okay. Don't worry, don't worry about it if you're wrong or whatnot. So remember, there's hydrogens and oxygens that are in the inside of this, okay? And there's hydrogens and there's oxygens that are on the inside of this, which means that there's protons, neutrons, and electrons that are in there. So between the two of them, which one has more particles just to start with, okay? Autumn, which one has more particles between these two? Okay, teapot. Why? Because there's more solution, which means that there's more water in there, which means that there's more hydrogens, which means there's more oxygens, which means there's more protons, which means there's more oxygens, or I'm sorry, electrons and neutrons, right? Everybody good with that part of it? Yes. All right, so our definition is the fact that we have the total motion of particles movement in an object. So if our temperature is the same between these two, okay, so if our temperature is the same, it comes down to which one has more solution? Which one is bigger? Which one has more particles? And between the two of them, this one has more particles, right? So my hazelnut coffee has, has cooled down to room temperature, okay? Since this morning when I made it at about six o'clock, okay? And I have distilled water that's been in here since my seventh graders did a lab uh, last week. So same temperature, room temperature, room temperature. For the sake of this, we'll say that it's uh, we'll say it's 30 degrees Celsius. We'll say se we'll go 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep it simple with something you're familiar with. 72 degrees, 72 degrees. There's probably like three, maybe four sips that are left of the hazelnut coffee in here. I have half a gallon. Which one has greater thermal energy? Alicia? The water. And how come? You're exactly right. How come? There's more particles that are inside here, right? Very good. Everybody see the difference? All right, good. Now, um, I want to introduce you to our couple definitions about heat uh, that we should have seen in the lab. I'm going to introduce Mr. or Mrs. Sunshine. Coming off is the electromagnetic waves. Ultraviolet infrared visible light. And I am going to draw, this is going to be a deck or what you could consider to be like blacktop or you could even think of it as being sand. And I am going to draw myself uh, fresh out of the weight room. Wait for it. There I am. Give me some fingers. Give myself a little, give myself some hair too. All right, so there I am. Um, so we learned, we learned that in the last section, 50% of the energy comes from the sun as infrared radiation. It strikes an object, it warms it up. All right, and I can remember several times last summer when it was like a Sunday and I was gonna go outside and grill some brats or hamburgers and I went out there barefoot and I stepped on the deck. Ouch, 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 ouch. I gotta put some sandals on or something, like some flip flops on because I'll tell you what, it was hot. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced that before. Oh yeah, everybody's hands are up for the most part. So what happens is there is heating that is occurring. The sun is transferring its energy to the deck. The deck, in return, is transferring its energy to you. That is called a heat transfer, all right? And specifically, it is given, bless you, given the name of conduction, okay? Conduction is the direct transfer of energy from one object 
tool another. All right? And we saw this in the lab. Okay, we saw this in the lab. It was actually when you had the water with the ice in there, you let it chill for about five minutes, and then you came back and you dropped the dye in. And the dye moved really, really slow. Okay? Had the water been completely frozen, the dye would have sat at, sat at the top. But because it was just chilled, it moved very, very slowly. And had I left the water sit for about an hour, just like my coffee has done, it would come to room temperature, which would mean that the dye would slowly start to move faster and faster and faster. Because what's happening is the energy from the dye is being transferred to the cold beaker. Even there's, though there's more solution in the beaker, it always goes hot to cold. That's how it transfers. The energy gets transferred from the hot object to the cold object. Even though your temperature in your body is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're stepping on a hot deck, the deck is hotter than your foot. So what's happening is that the deck, or the blacktop, or the sand, is transferring the energy of the heat to your foot. And so your foot begins to get warmed up. Alicia, you had your hand up. Sorry, I didn't get to you. Oh, it, when it was boiling, the water was boiling, did the dye go because the particles were moving super fast. So those hydrogens and those oxygens that are inside there, which are made up out of protons, neutrons, and electrons, they're flying around smacking into each other, which is what's gonna cause the thermometer liquid to go up. The opposite happens when you cool it off. The particles come closer together and they, they still move, they just vibrate, they just vibrate. And the closer they are in a solid, they're still moving. They just are vibrating next to each other, okay? Make sense, conduction? Easy to understand. Transfer of energy, hotter object to a cooler object. Second type of heat transfer is going to be, again, here's Mr. or Mrs. Sunshine with its electromagnetic waves. And here I am. Big neck this time. Give myself some good hair there. Give myself a little t-shirt that has my initial on it there. And I'm going to be checking out the sun right now. Look at me looking at the sun, actually looking down, but whatever. So <laughs> um, you might have experienced this one too, okay? I had this one. I was outside, and I was reading a book. This happened last, actually it happened last fall. I finally uh, had a Saturday where I was... Uh, I was done with football and I was sitting outside and the sun was striking me. And I remember thinking, oh, what a beautiful day. I can feel the warm sun shining on me. And I continued to read and a couple minutes later, I thought, wow, the sun is really warming me up. I can feel it getting warm. A little bit longer after that, I noticed that I was starting to sweat. I'm really getting warm. And I sat for a little bit longer and I had more sweat coming down me and I said finally, this is ridiculous. I'm going back inside to the central air. And so what was happening is the sun was transferring its energy. It was transferring its heat energy to me. And it does this in the form of what we call radiation. Okay, radiation is a form of energy, so it's the transfer of energy by electromagnetic waves. And if you remember from the previous section, those are going to be our ultraviolet, UV, infrared, and visible light, okay? But this is going to be specifically coming to us as infrared radiation, okay? And so we get warmed up by the sun through infrared radiation. And you might have also experienced this if you've gone to a buffet, put your hand underneath the like hot lamps, those warm lights, and all of a sudden, 
you'll feel the warmth that's coming down from there. And if you leave your hand set for long enough, it's going to get warm, real warm. All right. All right. Last definition, and probably the most important definition, was if we take again Mr. or Mrs. Sunshine. Happy now. Um, and we take our land, again, or we could have water, whichever you want, and we know that 50% is coming as infrared radiation. It's absorbing into the land or the water. We know that from the lab, sand, which is land, heats up faster than water, all right? But what we've also discovered is that near Earth's surface, the air is going to be warmer than the higher up you go, okay? And if you don't believe me, look at a mountain, okay? At the very top of a mountain, you're gonna see that there's a snow cap that's usually on it. Well, if it was warm, there wouldn't be snow up there, all right? But down on the ground, it can be very, very warm. In fact, I know there are some people that uh, you have worn shorts and then all of a sudden they continue to go higher and higher and higher while hiking and it gets colder and colder and colder. Okay? Now, what we also need to do is we need to explain some things. We know that warmer air is less dense, which means that it is lighter. Okay? If we talk about colder air or cooler air is going to be more dense. And remember, density is the amount of mass per the amount of volume. And it's heavier. And the reason for this is that as you warm up air, the particles will move further apart from each other. As they move further apart from each other, they become lighter. There's more space between them. And so they easily rise. That's the reason why they say that warm air rises because it's less dense. It's scattered further apart. The particles are further apart from each other. Cold air, on the other hand, particles come closer together. They are heavier, more dense, right? So in the summertime, if you have a two-story house, oftentimes you will open up dampers that allow for airflow for the colder air to be where? Where do you want it? To be upstairs for cold air or downstairs, based on upstairs our theory that we have? Downstairs would be incorrect. Upstairs. Because look at cold air is more dense, it's heavier. So if you want to cool your house faster, you want to have more colder air pumped upstairs, particles are closer together, it is going to fall down. And so it's going to cool from the top to the bottom, because remember, warm air rises. The cooler place is going to be down towards the bottom. So that's why you want to make sure that you, um, in the, in the wintertime, you want to do the opposite. Heat the bottom because of the fact that warm air rises. Okay, I'll get to your question. I just got finished with the notes. All right, so with that being said, closest to the ground is going to have warm air. So according to our theory, what is going to happen to the warm air? Is it going to go up or is it going to stay down? It's going to go up because warm air less dense is going to rise. As it goes up, it is going to begin to cool and get heavy and it's going to fall back down. <clears throat> and so what happens is we see this heating, rising, cooling, falling. Heating, rising, cooling, falling. It's actually given a fancy name called convection <coughs> currents. And so convection currents is this idea of heating air. It cools, falls back down. And this keeps happening over and over and over again. But what's happening is that there are pressure changes. And because of these pressure changes, it is actually going to create wind. And since we have wind that's created from this, it's actually going to start to help with the movement. Because so far all we know is that sun heats up land. Sun heats up water. 
We know that our atmosphere helps keep in this warm. We now know that we have air that's heating up, it's rising, it's cooling, it's falling down. And so it's creating different pressure. And that pressure is going to create the wind. And we discover that there's actually wind that's blowing about 10 kilometers above Earth's surface that's called the jet stream. And what you're going to discover in our next section is that this wind helps to move these huge air pockets that are going to collide with each other to start making our weather, okay? I'll take questions in a second here. I just want to stop the recording. That's the end of our notes.